Welcome, everybody, to this week's The Top 10 Show. Uh, this week, we are coming live to you from Collider Studio. No, it's not live. We always record this stuff. We just wanted to trick you guys. Uh, but it is the post-Comic-Con episode. I had such a great time at Comic-Con meeting so many of you. It's such a blast. And uh, we are going to do one today that's Top 10 Actor-Director Combinations in Honor of the Release of the Jason Bourne Movie, which he did with Paul Greengrass, and he's done that franchise for quite some time together. As always, I am John Roca, one of your co-hosts for the show, joined by the amazing... Matt Nose. thank you for doing all the heavy lifting on the front of that. That was awesome. <laughs> now we just get to get in and have some fun. I appreciate that. You like got all the homework out of the way and just like, you want to go play outside? Because <laughs> I do. So <laughs> thank you. That was great. That was so professional. It was beautiful. It was crisp. That's thank why you. I like you as a partner. Oh. Your money in the bank. I don't know if I like that Oh, but... I like that. We'll work on it. Yeah, well, I can't... Another Jason Bourne. I'm actually so excited, aren't you? Yeah, I'm massively excited. And the trailer and I, looks great. I, I hope it's somewhere close to the first one. Yeah. That's my hope. It's You're never going to exceed. I still like the others, but right. that's where you fell in love with that character. Mm -hmm. And you just... You went from believing Matt Damon. It's Matt Damon. The worst he got was what? The talented Mr. Ripley? That's you not know, the worst. He was good in that. No, no, I'm saying like as a physical character. Oh, can kick yes. Some ass. Yes, yes, yes. And you're yes. like, I don't know if Matt Damon can do this. And then you see him and you're like, Matt Damon could kill 100 people right now. <laughs> After watching it, looks so believable. All the choreography is so masterful. And then like does all the fights yeah. with the, the pin and into the dudes. Oh, yeah. it's brutal. I'm just thinking Team America. Matt Damon, Matt Damon, Matt, Matt Damon, Damon, Matt Damon, Matt Damon. Uh, it's so great. Yeah, it's so good. So, um, guys, as, all, as you know, every week we pick a topic based on what's being released and like we said it's actor director combinations this week with what we think is their best movie from that is that what we're doing too or yeah. we're just talking about their movies yeah. yeah i think it's the their combo and then best yeah. or your favorite movie of theirs but i think i stuck mm -hmm. to their best and i also wanted to to do like some guys used different actors and they're like i've used them in seven films yeah. this one he had a bigger you know part in right he was the focus of so i focused on that right gravitated towards that because yeah. there are other films that would have made it. They're my favorite of them when they work together. But yeah. it's just like you had a smaller part. Yeah. Uh, it's nothing against your part. It's amazing. Right. But the way the show works yes, please is uh, once we set a topic, John and I go our separate ways and create personal top ten lists. And then we show back up here. I do my bottom three. He does his bottom three. I do my next two. He does his next two. And we trade one apiece. Once we've revealed our personal top tens, we create the shows between us. Boom! There it is. Nailed it. I think it was the best Nailed I've ever done. It. So welcome to perfection. <laughs> that's right, right. That's right. We've done a lot of high fives lately. <laughs> I, I love remember. it. Well, we're on camera now. We can high five. That's it's the true. Best. We could have done an audio. That's we true. Could have done an audio. That's true. It wouldn't have worked as we hard. We just got to uh, tell you that we did it. For those people who are complaining, maybe thinking to themselves, why isn't it top 10 spy movies? Well, you know the top 10 show. We like to zig when you think we're going to zag. So this is what we're doing this week to act top 10 acting director combinations. Matt Nost, start us off. What is your number 10? So my number 10, uh, we may have to punt. Sure. I'm not entirely sure. All right. But it is John Ford and John Wayne in 1956's The Searchers. We're absolutely punting. Okay. So put that nice, beautiful graphic up, if we're even doing we that graphic that. anymore. No, we're not doing it. All right, fine. There it is. There it is. There Boom! It is. Where's See? the whistle? Ask for it, and they deliver. Thank you. Love in it. the back. Great job. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. All right, what's your number nine, then? So then my number nine mm -hmm. is a dynamic duo of Wes Anderson and Bill Murray. In 1998's Rushmore. That's great. That's my number 10. Is it? Yes, absolutely. Let's talk about it. Um, it's. I wish he would feature Bill. I know they did in Zissou, but when they were yeah. together, and like it's him and Schwartzman are the co-leads of yeah. this. And, I mean, he comes to life. Mm -hmm. There's a like a joy and a mischievousness that you missed in Bill Murray. And the, him and Schwartzman going back and back, uh, back and forth, getting more and more juvenile. Mm -hmm. And eventually they kind of side with one another on yeah. certain issues when new players come into the mix and suddenly they're on the outs, both of them. And it just yeah. that overall, like, to see that friendship between the two of them, so much trust between the actor and the director. Yeah. And it's blossomed into all these other movies that yeah. know that was the start of it. I love that film. Yeah, what's great about Rushmore is introduce Schwartzman, but it really reimagines Bill Murray. It's yeah. another phase of his career. Like, he they almost reintroduced to a whole new generation. And to those of us who have watched him since the beginning, he is reintroduced in a whole different way. And he's so fantastic and vulnerable in ways that he never was in his other films. You know, because he's always the smart ass. He's always knew yeah. better. He was always on top of you're, it. You're behind that rough exterior of, I'm a smart ass. I can say whatever. Go ahead. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't. Nothing. You know. Penetrates the shell. Right. And then to see him actually just make that turn. He's like the more vulnerable character. Yeah. Kind of what he gets to a little bit in Groundhog Day, but he's still a prick. You Absolutely. Know what I mean, he yeah. has the best of both worlds. Well, it that always one. works out for him in every film that he's in, no yeah. matter what. Even when he's a nut, like because in What's Up Bob or whatever that's called. Yeah. What up? Is that what it's called? <laughs> what's up, Bob? What about Bob? What, what about, about Bob? Bob? Yeah. He's, I just like you. What's yeah. up, Bob? <laughs> what's up? Get past the Bob. 
What's going on I over there? I can't put them all in here. Some some of them you know, leak out. Well, that, yeah, but yeah. I, we both know that I love that film more you do, than you, you do. You do, you do. It's, fit, I'm, it's sailed. But this is this is what's great about Rushmore is this is the first time Bill Murray stuff doesn't work out for him. He's in a crappy marriage. Yeah. Like that whole scene when he's in the swimming pool with cigarettes his and kids, his kids are sw- and the, the song that's playing. It's just brilliant. All right, what's your number eight? At number eight, I've yes. got Paul Thomas Anderson and C- uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. In 2012's The Master. Wow, that's a great choice. Not on my list. Not on your list? No, but it's a great choice. I wanted, this is one of those ones, I wanted to put Boogie Nights because that's my favorite. Yeah. But his part is so small, it's fantastic. It is. He has some of the most memorable, just that stupid, st- in the car. <sighs> oh, just, you feel for that character. Yeah. But in The Master, to see him and Joaquin, and it's this two polar ends of the spectrum coexisting. One of them, like a, they have this weird symbiotic relationship Absolutely. between the two of them. Mm-hmm. And Hoffman going through these blowhard explanations and when anyone takes him to task, he instantly just cuts them down. For yeah. shame, how dare you? I'm yeah. this superior intellect and all these people buy into the, the BS that he's spinning. It's just so impressive because to see like that L. Ron Hubbard character come to life. Yeah. The type of bravado you'd have to and I love the very end when uh, one of his most devout supporters comes up and asks him about the verbiage in the new edition of the book and it changes and it skews you know, the original intention. He's just kind of like, I don't know, I can't keep up with these lies. Yeah. In essence. Yeah. Which, just, is, which is why anybody who's saying it's not about Scientology is out of their minds. It's it is. Just, it's so obviously about L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology. But what's so great about the film, and you're right, what, what Paul Thomas Anderson brings out at Seymour Hoffman, he really brings out all his essence and talent as a lead character in this movie. Yeah. And he's so powerful. And you're right. It's a great reference to Boogie Nights. That's one of that's him as a character actor. But this is him as a lead. This, exactly. But to see also, like, I want these combos to where you know both sides put in just as much yeah. attention and detail to their parts. Absolutely. Even though, you know, Hoffman would in a smaller part. Yeah. But the care that he's going to put into this is just going to create something. Yeah. And Joaquin. I mean, it's a gorgeous oh, yeah. marriage between the two of them. Absolutely. Like, that... that Testing or whatever meter scene, oh, the no blinking. That's great acting. Oh my god, I I tried to after a while keep my eyes open, yeah. see if I can do this. And it's my favorite Phyllis Seymour Hoffman performance, favorite bar none, because of how deep he goes and how you see all the extremes from how vulnerable and sweet he can be to how terrible he can be, yeah. and what a terror he can be. And it's so fantastic to that end scene where he basically disavows any knowledge of Joaquin Phoenix's character ever existing in his life. They had which to. Which is so powerful, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, so are we going to my number 10 now? That we are. Okay. My number 10. As we said, Wes Anderson, Bill Murray, and Rushmore. I agree with Matt there. My number nine is, and I don't know if we're punting, is Quentin Tarantino and Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction. Punt, my friend. Let's nice. see that gorgeous graphic Hi-oh. one more time. Bing. Right. right there. Didn't know Beautiful. if it would make your list. I didn't know if it would make your list. Uh, I made my list. That's we were great. punting. What do you got at eight, All friend? right, so my number eight is John Huston and Humphrey Bogart in The Treasure of Sierra Madre. Uh, not on my list. Okay, that's fine. Listen, this film is fantastic. And if you haven't seen, it is one of the best Humphrey Bogart performances. And John Huston used him a few times, definitely in a number of other films. But in this film, I think it's the classic quintessential Humphrey Bogart. He is a desperate man trying to find money, trying to find food, trying to survive, and he gets taken on this really crazy adventure to try to find gold in the, you know, the, yeah. essentially the treasure of the Sierra Madre. And Walter Houston, John Houston's father, plays this nutty prospector who is constantly like, he's constantly like what in Shakespeare, which you have the comic relief, the, the person making all the really biting jokes, the, the fool in essence yeah. at times in King Lear. He is that, and as Humphrey Bogart's more and more desperate, and because he's judgmental of the entire world, when he gets into that situation, he sees his own behavior turned back on him, and it is brilliant. And it's one of the best performances I've ever seen of Bogart, and Houston gets such great stuff out the, of him. The only thing I saw years ago, I, I vaguely yeah, yeah, yeah. remember it. Unfortunately, yeah. I haven't gone back to revisit it. The only thing I remember at this point now about it is that you, you Houston... Say, yeah, go ahead. Well, Houston and Bogart managed to stay healthy throughout the whole thing because they're the only ones that didn't yeah. drink the water because they were just... You know, shit house. And yeah, I yeah. apologize for the language, <laughs> but there's no other way to describe it. Apparently, they found Houston passed out in his chair a couple of times, yeah. just like the the scene ends, and people are just kind of like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> "What's going? Somebody want to wake him up?" Uh, and then everybody else got dysentery or yeah. something just awful. And that's yeah. what I remember about that movie is everybody else was just destroyed, and these guys just got drunk the whole time. But that's 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 the that's how it used to be. Damn it, you used to drink and go show up and do the acting. That's how it was back then. Now it's like you know, it's very much not like that. But what is also great about is the uh, is the legacy of it in the Bugs Bunny cartoons because I think that's the character that's coming up going hey brother can you spare a dime in those old Looney Tunes oh, cartoons okay. is Bogart's character from the treasure of the Sierra Madre uh, alright what's your number 7 my number 7 is Spike Lee and Denzel Washington in 1992's 
Malcolm X. That's a punt. My that friend. is a punt. Absolutely. Not by much, but it's still a punt. Fair enough. All right. What's your number six? My number six is one we punted from for okay. you, so get that. Well, actually, we don't need the graphic the second time around. <laughs> Thank you. I got a finger the point. See, I screwed graphic? up on that one. Is it the See? touchdown graphic? That was on, my, oh, that was on me. <laughs> uh, it was uh, Tarantino and Sam Jackson for Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I, I almost took the Hateful Eight just because his part is yeah, technically larger. Right. But in this one, he's the only character that kind of makes an emotional shift. Yeah. So it's a more complex character in a lot of ways, as yeah. opposed to, there's nothing wrong with it. The, the story goes this way, yeah. and not a lot of people get the opportunity to learn something from it. Right. So to see him make that change, and it's like, I, I don't know, the character had a little bit more in this one, plus it's the iconic one. Right. It's, you know, he got an, M, or an Oscar nod. I almost said an Emmy nod. The Emmys loved it so much, they tried to give him a nod. <laughs> That's how much we all love this performance. True. Very true. It I remember is, watching true. that ceremony. It was a bit uncomfortable. Yes, but he has, like, all the great memorable scenes that you instantly flash back to, yeah. like, at the top five or top ten, hey? Yeah. Uh, nice. He, he dominates quite a few of those mm -hmm. with various parts throughout. I mean, there's also mm -hmm. the Travoltas and whatnot, but right. it's... The best, my favorite part about him as one of Tarantino's actors, nobody brings to life Tarantino's words better than yes, Sam Jackson. Absolutely. Nobody. Sam Jackson is the best arbiter of Tarantino's mm -hmm. words. And this is, the reason it's Pulp Fiction for me as well, Matt, is because this is the one that announced Sam. Yeah. That Sam was a character actor. He was doing work. He was working all around. But this one put him on the stratosphere of st stardom. And he is why he's all the, where he is now, being in a Star Wars movie, being in all these things that he is. And also what you mentioned, Inglorious Bastards. It's fa He's fantastic in that movie. Precisely right. Not Inglorious. Huh? Not Inglorious. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In, uh, in uh, Hateful Eight. Yeah, now he's you got He's fantastic me. in that movie because of the work he does with Tarantino throughout all, Jackie Brown, all these numerous yeah. films. He's even the small part he played in Kill Bill as the pianist in the in the church. He still brings his own Sam Jacksonness to us to it, and Tarantino frames Listen, him really, really well. In don't that. you love his Capital One co uh, commercial? <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it's, if, if you got to do it, man, you got to work. Good for you. I don't yeah. know what they had to pay you for that day, but he's, congratulations. He's, he's certainly doing the Sam Jackson version yeah. of the Capital One Every time. Look, the man found a hook, and yeah. he is riding that to seven-figure, like, you know, paydays left and right. He's just missing the mf -er. Like, what, what's in yeah, your wallet, it mf -er? It's you know? the same attitude. It's the same thing. Absolutely. Uh, and, and in this film, you really see him come into his own because of the twist that happens at the end where he gives up this life that he was so good at. You know, the Ezekiel speech. My God, that's still one of the best monologues ever on screen and it's tarantino's words directing sam jackson saying them and that's why it's on our list i wonder if when he <clears> was writing it he had him in mind because I later on in the did. characters he brings to life he obviously does you yeah. know that he wrote that part for him yeah but that first one is just like wow it's your now you're what i envisioned for quentin's inner monologue yeah. in a lot of different scenes yeah. it's just like he's visualizing now this this and this mm -hmm. but if they didn't know each other beforehand, like yeah. that's even more impressive. And he's also like Tarantino's a defense against people oh, yeah. like Spike Lee, who complained that he uses the N word yeah, too much in his screenplays. Sam Jackson is always defending Tarantino, saying this is how we speak. He's just writing how well, we speak. Case in point, Django. Yeah, Django. Django absolutely. He, oh, because of the character that he is willing to play in that movie, which is just despicable it across really the is. board. I mean, he is something I would have said on the old show begins with a C, and I would just have dropped it really hard. That's what that character is in that movie. I'll hold back. You know what I mean? Uh, and sure, that's holding the, back. Yeah, it is holding, holding back. back. Is that thank not holding back? That is censoring. <laughs> just put a something over <laughs> a my mouth <laughs> and just wait. When did you, we can we can clean it up. We should get these little black things that we can put into uh, anyway, right, right there. Uh, muffle the sound. Do something. Yes. But because he's got Sam Jackson, he knows that Sam Jackson is, is fearless in his works. Yeah. Like, I can get away with this, and I need this character to be this heinous. Yeah. Because it's part of this terrible world that you've yeah. set up. But they have that partnership, and it really, you know, in this movie is when it, you know, we first saw it all blossom right, right before our eyes. It's just Agreed. impressive. Okay, so my number seven is Albert Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart in Vertigo. Okay, no, yeah. not on my list. They, they worked a few times together, Rope, a couple of other films, uh, Rear Window. But to me, this is the best version of Jimmy Stewart with Alfred Hitchcock. And I think they both got the best out of each other as a director and as an actor. And I think that's what this whole list is all about. And in Vertigo, you really see Jimmy Stewart, this guy we saw in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, this guy we saw in It's a Wonderful Life. We saw a glimpses of his darkness in It's a Wonderful Life. But he'd basically been this like American icon hero, you know, yeah. everyday, everyman hero. 
Nero. He was Americana in, exactly. in, 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 in human form. Exactly. And then what happens in Vertigo is we see all of the destruction of that. We see a desperate man trying to pursue very selfish pursuit of love into the point where he tries to manipulate a woman into looking like a, a woman he had been in love with who fell, who supposedly killed herself at the beginning of the movie. Yeah. And you find out, and I don't want to spoil it too much for people who haven't seen it. Please go see it if you haven't seen it. But you see Jimmy, Jimmy's anger and like these flaws and this real like uh, ugliness uh, explored within him and he's he does it so well as an actor and you didn't know that he had this ability to play that kind of part within him and Hitchcock because of his ability with horror because of his ability to go real deep into the horror of man yeah really brings it out in him see I'm holding back because I have something else okay so that's the only reason I'm just like you know what I'm gonna let you say your piece because I'm gonna do the same thing <laughs> Okay. Try and come up with new things. So we'll move on to the next one? Yep. Yeah, okay. So my number six, then, is the one we punted from earlier from Matt. John Ford, John Wayne, The Searchers. Okay. One of my favorite Westerns, bar none. So fantastic. John Wayne, it, once again, here's a character that we had seen as an icon Americana. It's so funny. These are the, right next to each other. An icon of Americana, the Western guy, the good guy. He'd always done the right thing. And here he is in The Searchers, essentially a racist, essentially a, a not a good... He's a product of his time. Well, so. well, they were abolitionists in the 1800s. I yeah, don't buy were, that excuse. That's true, I'll never but they were buy that also, excuse. Uh, they, uh, they were a fraction of the population. Like, right. You had to change the minds of a lot of people before you can get there. Well, so, they tried to they, destroy slavery in the in, before they had the, with the, when they were writing the Constitution. So, so people did not like this idea I of understand. going against racists. But at the same time, like having a character that is racist is kind of commonplace. There are a lot of racists at that no, time, no. at least the way we view what that, that term means now. Right, but my argument is the reason that he is supposed to be a racist. He's not supposed to be a a good, he's not supposed to be a good hero. He's supposed to be an anti-hero. That's the thing about this Western. I think it's a neo-Western in that it explores and destroys the myths uh, yes. of, these, of this idea of a Western. Yes and, and no. I, I, I think, like, it's still on my list. Right. And I like the movie a lot, but at the same time, like, they, they go back and forth in tonality sometimes of still selling, like, the Americana and all this idealism. Yes. And then it comes back over and it takes this weird hard edge out of nowhere and just kind of goes back and forth at times. They're like, I don't know what signals exactly you're trying to send. Well, to I think this is why I put it on my list. I think Ford's trying to show the under the the, the dirty underbelly of this Americana of West. Yes. The, yes. Uh, what is it? That place in Wyoming that they always shoot is a beautiful place to see and, and, and look. You yeah. Know, all that kind of. I can't remember right now the, the location. But it's beautiful to see. But but know. underneath it, there is there are these very hard, tough men that that uh, created the West, that that founded the West, pioneered the West, and dealt with the West. And you had to be that hard and tough to live there and then deal with the Native Americans that were there and maybe through those fights. Because he says in the film at some point that he will kill Natalie Wood if she she, she is a full on. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, she's right? converted yeah. to the you know he, he to will being a Comanche or Comanches. He says right, right. then he will kill her because that's a better fate than what she's lining up for herself. Exactly. And so, yeah, he's, I mean, I'm not defending no, the no, character. No, no, of course not. Of course not. Uh, and I like it. I like the fact that it comes out when it does and it's a complex character. Mm -hmm. Because Absolutely. there's still, there's still so much within Westerns at that point which is just selling like everything was fine. You yeah. know what I mean? We had these battles and nobody seems to die or die all that much and right. we come out victorious and actually see like there's collateral damage when you mm -hmm. do these types of actions mm -hmm. and you go and you seek for revenge or you infringe upon what another person views as their, their land mm -hmm. and now you're clashing over it. Uh, I like, you know, it's it's rare to see from that time. Yeah. That's why this movie's always stuck out for me. It was trying to tell a more honest tale as Agreed. opposed to the whitewashed version we've been selling ourselves for like 15, 20 years at that point. Yeah, exactly. And John Ford does a great job yeah. of bringing that out of John Wayne. It's it's To me, it's my favorite performance of John Wayne in any film ever. Uh, oh, it's Just up there. Me. It's Just up there. I, I have to think about it. Okay. I mean, I don't know if I can come up with it right now. Uh, okay, well, let's yeah, move on. We got to move on. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, we got another show to do. I don't know what I'm talking <laughs> what's about. What's your number five? I did like kind of reset there and be like, what would it be? Why am I doing this? Uh, my number five Stop, is, mind. Stop. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just like, that's a wormhole. It, <laughs> only like just a time suck. Anyway, we're doing it right now. Yeah. All right, Mance. Yeah, number, five, number five. Just three more things. <laughs> number five is Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio in 2013's Wolf of Wall Street. I had to make a choice. Okay. And I had to with with Scorsese, so that is not on my list. And I had to make a choice. That's fine. And I went with my choice, my gut. That's the beauty of the show. Yes, it's a personal list. Of course. How you made this list? There's a, so many omissions, which is like, wow. If I there love really their are. work as much as someone else would, yeah. they think it's a crime, an absolute crime, to keep them off Absolutely. this list. It's Absolutely. Just, it's arbitrary. It's a, it's my taste. Right. Yeah. I'm Absolutely. trying to do the best that I can. You know. Listen, you're doing great. Uh, I love that movie. I think that's going to be one of the most rewatchable from the two of them, the pairing for me. Yeah. It is 
the amount of confidence they each have in each other to go and do whatever they want to. Mm-hmm. I mean, the scene that everybody gravitates towards is DiCaprio army crawling. With the you know, quaaludes, trying, yeah. yeah, after he's taking those lemons and whatever else. Yeah, the and yeah, they took an extra 90 minutes to kick in, and they took so many more. And then once it does, I mean, he's just out of his mind. Like, I mean, who hasn't been there? Yeah, yeah to like, that mental state? I don't know. <laughs> that's pretty rarefied air, you know? He is on all kinds of things at yeah, that point really of the movie, because I imagine he was doing other things before he even set foot near the, the ludes. <laughs> According to him, like, when you wake up, and there's the champagne in the morning, and I take uppers, yeah. and then I take downers for this, and just like, I, I don't know how your brain works. <laughs> it's just swimming in pharmaceuticals all day long. But to see, like, just the faith between the two of them in that scene alone where mm-hmm. Scorsese is like, just go for it. Yeah. Just go. I trust you. You trust me. I, we both know exactly what we're going to do. And there's so many choices in that movie like that. Just like, wow, it's great to see a friendship really right in front of you between two people that have to work together, but they enjoy it so much yeah. that it comes through. And, and it's genuinely art. Yeah. And that one, I've, I've already rewatched it more than a bunch of other Scorsese that have been out lately. Yeah. And I think that's going to be probably top of the heap unless they do another, you know, even better one, Devil in the White City or yeah. 2017, I think that is. Yeah, that's a good, Matt, that's a great choice. I mean, I, again, I, I, would, yeah. I would argue both Aviator and Wolf of Wall Street, but mm-hmm. I think you're right. Wolf of Wall Street is both of them at the top of their game with each other. I absolutely agree with you there. Uh, all right. So my number five is the I think we when we punted from earlier, Spike Lee, Denzel Washington, Malcolm yep. X. Uh, one of my favorite films slash biopics ever made. Uh, just I think it's Spike Lee at maybe the last best film he's made, in my opinion, that it wasn't a documentary. Uh, and I'm talking on the fly, so maybe I might be wrong. But I I'd feel have to like, look, but I, I have a feeling you're right. This yeah. came out in 92? Yeah, well, yes, around there, yeah. And it's, no, 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 Inside Man. Inside Man, I like. Inside it's not great. Good. It doesn't achieve right. what Malcolm X does, because Malcolm X is rarefied air. This is an air. epic. It's, it's an rarefied epic. air. Yeah. It, it took a character that I passingly knew mm-hmm. as a young whatever, 12, 13-year-old kid. Sure. Because Malcolm X doesn't come up in my world all that often. Right. Uh, and just, you know, finding out about him and, like, Farrakhan and yeah. the entire, you know, uh, Muslim Brotherhood. Elijah Muhammad. Yeah. yeah, Elijah Muhammad in that. And to see the arc of that character, I started one way. I, like, I understood why he made the choice he did. Yeah. He saw what the other side was doing. It was like, that, that will only work... Maybe. Yeah. And I think this way has a better way to get us equality, which is standing up and actually fighting for our rights as opposed to going the more, you know, the the way the other side did. Uh, And not knowing that story and you just, Mm -hmm. you become enraptured with this character and you follow him and you see his rise and then eventually there's deceit at the top and then him trying to extricate himself and all the people that he interacts with and how many world-changing events he was actually privy to and, yeah. and part of. It's, it's impressive. Yeah, and it's a fantastic movie. You see Spike Lee at the top of his game as a director taking you through this guy's entire life and capturing different time periods in American life, in American black life and American white life. And it's so, they're juxtaposed all the time throughout the film. And you see these characters through this epic biopic change and metamorphosize and get their comeuppance and sometimes get a terrible comeuppance. You know, in uh, uh, Indian Charlie, what happens to his arm? Like he just, yeah. he's a bum when he'd become this, he'd been this amazing guy in the 40s. But w- what we see with Denzel, I think, is what what we've been, what we had been waiting to see from Denzel for so long. He'd done these parts, he'd been always great in the these parts, you know, he was always great at being a badass. But what happens here is the vulnerability when he subdues to when he subjects himself to Elijah Muhammad to the Muslim to the in the in the prison. It is one of the most powerful scenes of abdication I've ever seen on screen. What? And sorry, yeah, no, no, and, and as yeah, and as it progresses to where he gets to the point where he's wearing the goatee and he has the glasses. There's such a power in him, but it's not a beat you or smiling no. kind of power that he has. It's a very reserved. Confident power. The power comes from his intellect. Yes. That's where he knows he can inflict exactly. the most amount of pain is right. his superior intellect. Mm-hmm. There is muscle behind that, but he's also calculated his positions and and figured out he has a game plan mm-hmm. and an idea. And you can see that fierceness yeah. in his eyes. And, and Denzel's done that like in glory. Yeah. You could see that. Oh, when he's getting whipped. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's a more graduated where he has to carry that emotional or emotionality. Is sure. that a word? That doesn't sound like a word. <laughs> That, that emotional, I don't know, we're yeah. going to skip past it, yeah. throughout the entire uh, movie where it's got to be restrained, but at the same time burgeoning on, bursting through it at any moment. Yeah. You have to feel that intensity and that, that struggle to Absolutely. hold it in. Yeah, and he does, and they do a good job. And this, for me personally, changed my life, this movie, because I quit my fraternity after I went to see this movie because I was like, because of that line he says, you never be part of something that you don't 100% believe in. 
And I left my fraternity that day. Like I went and saw it that afternoon, handed in my letters, moved out of college, went back wow. in the military, did all this. Shit. Like I just changed my life. Really? So, so was it fraternal life or like in I, college? You just like, you know what? This is not for me. Yeah, everything. I just was not for me. Everything, a fraternity, college, everything. How long had you been part of the fraternity at that point? Two years. Wow. Yeah. That was a heck of a change off of one movie. Yeah. This well, obviously, it'd been building. It yeah, wasn't exactly. Like, but it this, wasn't like, oh. This you gave know? you the motivational speech to <laughs> so whatever. You saw the hang in there Katie yeah. poster, and you're yeah. like, yes, it yes. finally makes sense. But he, he is one of my favorite like uh, people in history ever, Malcolm X. He's yeah. very complex. Anyone who denigrates him, has, to me, has no intelligence you at to, all. You have to you look have at all to, sides of the exactly, issue and understand exactly. like, why he was there and he existed in his place. Right. And, and you have to factor in his progression mm -hmm. to, to becoming a man who understood all sides. It wasn't against white people at the end. He was about integration at the end yeah, when he peace. started out so segregation-oriented. All right. Uh, what's your number four? Uh, my number four I don't think is going to make your list, okay. which is Tim Burton and Johnny Depp in 1994's <laughs> Ed Wood. Yeah, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that is that is. And everything happened with Johnny. I'm staying away from Johnny. So you go that ahead. That is perfection <laughs> in cinema. That is the marriage of two guys that have worked together for so long, mm -hmm. and they finally, instead of doing like it, still has that macabre undertone, like an emo-ish, I guess, that Tim Burton kind of always has or imbues in all his films. Yeah. And this one, I don't know. That is that that actual feeling come to life in a film. And the confidence, once again, I said it earlier, but the confidence of Johnny Depp in this part, mm -hmm. I have always, since the first time I saw it, it's like, this, this movie is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I love this. I fell in love with it the first time I saw it. And I can't wait, you know, the next time I actually watch it again, because it'll pop up eventually back in my queue. You know what I haven't seen in a while? And I'll put that on, like Bill Mur Murray floating in and out. It's just one of my favorite characters of all time. He steals every scene he really effortlessly. Does. He really does. But to Depp to allow... You know, Bill Murray in that. There's just like, yeah, please. The the more fun we're having, the more playful it is. It translates on the screen because yeah. they've done so many movies together. Yeah. And a character, you know, the director that made Plan 9 from Out of Space, yeah. the, the worst movie arguably of all time. And the process no, no, no. Of, The Room is still out there. Yeah, so, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But it's like one of those, it's held the title for long enough <laughs> yes. that it's always in the conversation. I was like Babe Ruth. <laughs> yeah, it's always true. in the conversation because <laughs> it's been in the conversation. Right. Even when the new best thing comes out. Yeah. Uh, and to see like the behind the scenes of how this movie gets made, like when the big huge guy, the wrestler, George the Animal Steel or mm -hmm. whatever, walks through and hits the door, and the whole set shakes, and they're yeah. like, "Hold on, should we, re you know, shoot that?" And he's like, "No, he'd have to deal with that like in real life. It's like in Boogie Nights, shadows in life, baby." Yeah, you know, we got to keep moving forward. Agreed. All right, that's a great one, man. Uh, I don't have anything else to offer. I, it's yeah. it's a great movie. I enjoyed uh, Johnny Depp in it. Uh, my number four is my only cheat in the in this uh, list because I had to put it in because it is one of my favorite films ever and one of my favorite combinations ever. David Lean and Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia. That's my number four. They didn't do multiple films together, but this film, to me, brought out... It is still my favorite Peter O'Toole performance and it's my favorite David Lean movie. And I think that's a reason because of their collaboration together. You mentioned something earlier. I thought the they'd done at least one more together. I don't think they have. It's him and Alec Guinness have done a a lot of films together. Uh, and yeah, Guinness. that's easily where and I'm Peter O'Toole it. only one. Yeah. And they brought each the best out of each other and I think that was what you mentioned earlier at the beginning of the show that it was what characterized your list and that's what characterizes this choice here because I think Peter O'Toole is never, he's never more powerful. It's a crime he didn't win the Oscar for this film. He is so fantastic and you get this typical Hollywood leading man, beautiful blue eyes, blonde hair, young, all this and you explore the depths of the degradation that he goes through as the film progresses and as he confronts his own naked desire for power, his selfish desire, his almost sociopathic desire for power in the desert uh, because he feels like a king out there. Yeah. Whereas back in England, he's just a guy doing things in the bottom of a, a bottom of a base somewhere. Uh, listen, you, you change your perspective, you change your reality. Exactly. And he goes here and he has a different utility and he yeah. can rise in life. Why would you ever go back to the previous? Like, right. here I am a king on some level. And then he realizes that he can't go back to his regular life because he goes out there for these utopian ideals. Yeah. But what happens is he becomes uh, drawn with the power. Let me ask can't you this. let it go. Had they done more movies together, would this be your number one? Still. I mean, it's such I, a... Look, I knew this was making... Yeah. That's why I assumed they had one. Once yeah. I thought about it, I was like, that's going to make John's list. <laughs> I just knew it. The guy's a huge fan of it. You go to yeah. see it all the time whenever really it's do. playing. Like, I knew it was making the list, yeah. so I just assumed they'd done at least two projects together. Yeah. So I, I, if they've done two... Would that be your number one then Still. on this list? It's, it, listen, yeah. I saw it six times in the theaters last year. Six times. Yeah. That's, I love the movie. I can't think of a single movie that pieces. has that kind of hook on me. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that's fair. That's uh, fine. If you want to cheat to yeah, get it, it on, is, listen, I know how cheat. you feel about the film, yeah. so that's fine. Okay. It's fine. What's your number Once again, three? it's a personal list. You that's right. Whatever you want. That's right. Do whatever you want. Yeah. Three is, uh, is Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart in 1954's okay. Rear Window. Okay. All right. That's why I didn't want to talk about Vertigo. That's fair. It's a toss-up between the two. Sure. I believe I like Rear Window more. 
hmm. just because of the amount of attention they get from such a simple premise. Yeah. And it keeps your attention the entire time and it builds. I mean, it's got a build that wouldn't, you know, if you release that today, that's a flop, unfortunately. Probably. Just because the pacing is so methodical as they build to things. But it's also, you're accusing a neighbor of murder. Yeah. The pace kind of needs to build methodically. You can't build up that kind of evidence in, you know, 12 hours and be like, suddenly, this, this story's <laughs> over. You know what I mean? A whiz-bang thriller and there's people running in and out and all that stuff. Right. Whereas this is just like, no, 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 it's a guy with too much time on his hands to obsess but his obsession ends up being correct. Yeah. But just the slow build, mm -hmm. it keeps the tension and new characters come in. And the, my only fault is it when the new characters switch to his way of thinking, it is always instant. Yeah. They've had, they've had their guard up like Grace Kelly mm -hmm. when she finally decides, like she sees something in the window and she's instantly, before the entire rest of the time, she was like, ah, I don't know, I don't know. And then it was just like, please tell me everything you know about the Truffauts or the Truffauts, I can't remember, it was yeah. just somethings. Yeah. And I uh, was just like, wow, that was a pivot right there. She just did a full 180 in like half a second. Yeah. It was impressive. But then a little later on there, like uh, the lady comes to massage him when she pivots and you're like, it wasn't as quick, but. Right. Uh, that being said, it's it's one of my favorite Hitchcocks. Mm -hmm. It's always held up for me. I've loved it since the first time I saw it. And it's fascinating because he's sitting still through the whole movie. Mm -hmm. Like there's, he's never gets out. Almost never That's gets out of that chair. That's how good he is. Yeah, I agree. That's how good, agree. like charismatic he mm -hmm. is. He can just suck you in just by sitting there. Yep. Like Tom Hanks could do that now. Yeah. He can just sit there Absolutely. the whole time. We've Absolutely. already seen him do it on Castaway. Yeah. <laughs> we have. It just. That's true. I, you know, I made fire was the only thing he said for it's ninety good. minutes. It's true. It's true. It was very good. All right, my number three is uh, Francis Ford Coppola, Al Pacino in The Godfather Part Two. Obviously, they'd done The Godfather Part Wait, wait. Not. Wow. Didn't. This is the second week in a row. I think it was because of certain extenuating circumstances. Were you Not shot? Not on my list. Were you shot? Uh, apparently mentally. <laughs> <laughs> I took a bullet okay. to the head. All right, fair. Uh, well, then uh, let me take this. Francis I Ford Coppola, Al Pacino. That's weird. Well, no, this is the rationale. This is the rationale, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, this is like you, what was it, a couple weeks ago on Roger Rabbit, and you're like, why didn't they make my you list? You find Pacino annoying? No, no, no. 30 seconds later, you're like, oh, this is why. No, this is why. Okay. I didn't want guys in a sequence of making sequels. Because then it's just like, you already know the characters, so I want you to get in there. I, I realize this is different, but that's why I didn't make because you could do that with a bunch of like, oh, they did these three films together. I yeah. love this. And she's like, well, that's not the same thing as they do a bunch of very different projects mm -hmm. and they manage to, to, to create all this different work. Okay. This is an exception that makes the rule. Yeah. I'm okay. not going to fight you on it, but yeah. that was my rule going into it. That's fair. Now, now I'm going to tell you why it's on the <laughs> Absolutely. That's the show right there. <laughs> fight me on it. What you got? No, I absolutely love it. It's, it's just the, Pacino's, it, once again, it's one of Pacino's. It's a, Pacino's best work is it's in his Godfather Part Two. Period. Yeah. Period. Period. And Coppola's best film, almost this side of Apocalypse Now. Like I would argue, Godfather Part I Two and Apocalypse, over Apocalypse Now. Apocalypse now. Absolutely. See, and that's the thing. There's a, there's a couple of things in Apocalypse Now that take it away from it that puts Godfather Part Two just above it. And I think it's once again, it's such an epic film. It's, it's it spans so many decades, and the fact that he can mirror two storylines that are coming at the same time, happening at the same time, but weave them in seamlessly, and have Pacino give one of his best performances one of his most chilling performances and no hua none of that yeah. is in there well, it's quiet it's understated and when he flips out and slaps Diane Keaton that has been building through the whole thing because she has quietly been undercutting him slowly through the whole film and he's been trying to rightly lie so, to himself though. Right, right, rightly so absolutely. she's the moral conscience of, of Michael and he yeah. doesn't want to hear it a convenient well, moral conscience exactly. she still took the money and had the kids come on at some point you have to realize what's happening we all gotta eat John yeah, it's we fair, all gotta eat fair. so you do you alright I'm not gonna worry about it. It's true, but I but I like what Pacino is doing through the whole film because he's doubling down, and then he has the moment with Fredo, which is a complete lie. But he has this vulnerable moment with his mom saying, "Why wasn't I loved as much as my dad?" Like these are all beautiful, quiet moments that are happening. And then he has that moment at the end when he uh, when he kills his brother, when he has his brother shot. It's from back away. Just the look on his face, and then the look down. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, so powerful. Uh, it's. You you brought up earlier about like Pacino. There's none of the hua. He hadn't yeah. built to that. Yeah, like this was still. Saying. This was like basically Pacino, in my mind, became Pacino in this movie. Yes. Where I agreed. You feel all the power of Corleone yeah. as he's restrained or he's unleashing it or he's dealing with all these myriad of problems. Yeah. Plus, the overall arc of that film is it's my favorite yeah. of that series. Agreed. It's just, it, it is their best work together. Yeah. And you're right to put it on your list. Thank you. What's your number two? My number two is Akira Kurosawa. In Toshiro Mifune. That's my number one, son. In 1954's Seven Samurai. Oh, I didn't put Seven Samurai. Mine's Yojimbo. Are you in Yojimbo? Because he's the lead in Yojimbo. Okay. Yeah. This, but you can, you can I defend only Seven know, Samurai. I think, three of theirs together. So I only, I've always associated, maybe four. It's a damn crime. 
It, hey, listen, right, listen. Ahead. There's only so many hours in the day. <laughs> we need I can fill, only do you need so to much. Fill them better. You, you, need to fill you them are better. a few years older than me. You've had a little oh, bit more time to ouch. watch movies. That's fair. There's no ouch, man. This I'm not going to disagree. That with is just a fact. Look, we're both old men. <laughs> you know, I had to stretch before I sit down just Come so on. I don't cramp up or something Come in this. I'm hour. not even sitting down. This is it was one of these uh, like <laughs> wheelchairs. Hovering? This is a wheelchair. This oh, that's awesome. I need to get one of those. Where's the budget? Anyway. In Seven Samurai, okay. I was surprised. I, I figured for sure. Yojimbo's yeah. great. I'm not taking mm -hmm. away from His part is bigger. It's really Yojimbo Senjuro, but yes. Go ahead. Uh, in Seven Samurai, it's, it's, it's a proto of so many genres of movies mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got the Western, but you also have like the team-up movie. Yeah. Kind of didn't exist before mm -hmm. this. Like mm -hmm. I, it, I'd be tough to find anything in my brain that existed before. It was this, where they create this band of characters, and they have to take out... Uh, you know, this rolling 40 bandits that are going through the yeah. countryside and it's farmers that are being attacked and the farmers have to reach out to... What's weird is they keep saying samurai, but they want... I, I always thought it was ronin they would really want because those are the roaming mercenaries that right. are of the samurai class. Well, they are samurais, but they're like, without a master. Yeah, so without a master. Ronins, yeah. So you're a mercenary. Yeah. But I, I love the, the dichotomy that Kurosawa builds within the movie mm -hmm. of... The villagers need them, so they like them, but ultimately they still view themselves as a higher caste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they look down on them at the same time. Yep. And it's this juxtaposition of their emotions and also the samurai or ronin dealing with them and, and trying to find honor and getting three squares a day yeah. for putting your life on the line yeah. to help these people. And ultimately, like at the end, it costs them more. Yeah. Like I love the line, the, the victory was for them, mm -hmm. which it was. We took severe casualties right. and we're left kind of destroyed on our side and they walk away the real victors yeah it's because they go back to their life and they have their yeah. life and they're and used to their, their life. life and this is their life like yeah they could die at any moment now, here's what i was and i don't want to get into a back and forth about who was a better choice because it's like it's not necessary they're both fantastic films yeah seven samurai is fantastic i go see it all the time at the arrow or at the egyptian when they're showing it it's beautiful film yo jimbo senjuro the only reason i chose those above seven samurai seven samurai is the introduction of toshiro mifune with kurosawa yo jimbo senjuro is the culmination of that. To me, it's the culmination. This side of High and Low. High and Low was almost the one I chose because I really love High and Low. But to me, this is the culmination of the samurai uh, movies that Kurosawa can create. Yeah, Yojimbo, definitely. There's just such a confidence in Mofuni, and he's the center. And he gives him Tetsuya Nakata yeah. as, as his rival, which is a fantastic rival, and how he progresses through the film. And the way he plays everybody is just so brilliant. And you get, once again, these are all based, the this, this spaghetti westerns came off based off yeah, with another proto Korea. it exactly, gave you a spin exactly. off of all of this right. you know, fistful of dollars is thanks to right. these these types of movies exactly and what's so great here is that to me like i said it's it's mifune at his best it's mifune is confident playful but then serious when he has to be when he's finally called on to use his uh to use his sword he is so deadly and so precise you understand why he's so chill and confident but through the whole film i also yeah but in seven samurai <clears throat> i love him because he's kind of in essence like the audience he's yeah. the young kid that wants to come along wants yeah. a part of the journey it seems like a lot of fun it seems exotic and interesting as opposed to the farming life that you're you know accustomed to well he's not the farmer in the thing right is he is that the far i thought is he, he was the, the young character? kid he's the young kid that yeah, latches right. onto you're right he tags along Ronin, That's right. Who's walking around? Right. So I always liked like he is the one that is kind of us and be like, come on, right. come on, please, like you know, yeah. as a kid would do. And it's nobody wants to be that part. Right, right, you right. want to be the badass that gets to go out there and slay everybody and you know yeah. say the, the sweet lines. But exactly. I, I agree with you. If we are going to that combo, I just you know, yeah, I think of the two of them together in that. Uh, I, I but that was your number one. That's that my number one. one. So my number two, yeah, is uh, Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, and Raging Bull. Okay, I it, number one chose uh, Taxi Driver. Okay, either way, it's kind of it was it's, a toss up. It's really is fair. It's a toss up. Okay, uh, well I will say since I was as my number uh, Raging Bull. I mean, it's one of the greatest performances ever by any actor in the history of cinema. Just the desperation from you hit you know that he is a phenomenally insecure man who does not trust anyone in his life yet he has this talent but he's also a broken child because he cries when he can't sell himself out he yeah. has these insane morals out of nowhere he has these morals this compass and de niro just such a fantastic job of conveying that and then also his destruction as the film progresses as he gets more and more desperate more despondent more 
comes face to face with the repercussions and consequences of how he's built as a human being, how he's destroyed his marriage, pushed away his kids to the point where he's sitting there in that in that yeah, prison at the very cell. End? Yeah, oh. well, not in the very end. I mean, in the prison. The very end is just a. a, a well, yeah. I, I know what you mean. But but in the that... prison cell, when he starts punching the walls, yeah. that's him really realizing what he's done to his life and what he's done to his entire world. And so, what he ends up as the, the fat guy reciting Shakespeare and stuff is pathetic in a, in a way. But he's also finally come to terms with his demons because he does ask apology. And so, it's a great work by 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 uh, Scorsese in the black and white, and great work by De Niro. I know it's such a tough part to do too. I mean, mm. granted, yeah, there's the physical nature of he yeah. had to put on all that weight. Yeah. Like I understand that, but it's also like the the character had to be so depressing at times to yeah. play, mm -hmm. because his I mean he was just constantly like basically Eeyore with big fists. Yeah, yeah. He and there was a rain cloud over him at all times. Even when he was happy, he was sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was just didn't like it. Didn't like the place he was at, even though he was going places. It was never good enough. Right. Like even even when he's fighting for the championship of the world, he still had this chip on his shoulder yeah. f that he was less than yep. and was, I'll fight you in the streets. I'll go, you know, right, right now, I'm better than you, but ultimately feeling that he's not, like this lesser yeah. individual. Never knock me down, Ray. Yeah. yeah. To hold that, that's yeah. what you take away yeah. from this just whooping that you've got and a career of whoopings and yeah. you're going to walk away with nothing ultimately. Exactly. That's what you hold on to. Well, what about, talk about Taxi Driver, man. Taxi Driver, it's... Uh, to see De Niro play this detached individual, it's a great snapshot of New York yeah, at that time. At that time. So it's so weird, like kids born today. Times Square was a seedy place. When I was a kid, yeah. I just remember like news reports on CBS and all that stuff with, you know, whoever, Brokaw or somebody, mm -hmm. and they'd show scenes from New York and every subway was graffitied 100% and it was this rough, like crack was everywhere. Yeah. Like that's all that I was sold. Porn but palaces. You, yeah, yeah, porn palaces, but you actually, you go back and you can find, really, you know, genuine footage of it and you're like, yeah. yeah, Times Square was disgusting. I can't believe they allowed Times Square yeah. to turn into this and the type of characters that draws in. At that big a crossroads, yeah. it's this weird hodgepodge of all these personalities, and here comes Travis Bickle, yeah. somehow weirder than all of them. Yeah. These just walking, there's pimps and prostitutes and drug addicts and thieves and everything else around him, and he is still stranger than all of this. Mm -hmm. It's a great scene when he goes up to the Secret Service guy and he's just like trying to befriend him, but also trying to figure <sighs> out, like, mm -hmm. get a size him up and whatnot. He thinks he's, you know, getting away with it until he's got to yeah. give his name and he realizes the jig is up. So he, he walks away casually after that. But the mania is that he's this just, just giving off in that scene is just so impressive. Just this confidence, you know, hands in his pockets, this all shucksian kind of, but there's a devilishness. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, the mania of that movie translated from the first time that I mm -hmm. saw it. And, you know, I don't know how much cocaine it took Scorsese to get through to make that film, but it was worth allegedly. it. It was just the right amount. Allegedly. Don't I get think, us sued. I think he's allegedly. On, he's on the record about allegedly. a thousand times at this I, point I talking care. about everything allegedly. that he's done. Pretty sure. Unless he's on the show with us saying he did it, I want to say allegedly. That's what we're yeah, you saying we got a chance to get Scorsese? <laughs> hey, man, anything's possible in the world. Look, if everybody out there knows somebody who knows somebody, let us know. I'm let sure us know. Cody Shoot knows an somebody. I'm sure Cody knows somebody. All right, so... All right, that's our separate lists. Let's uh, run down them again. Uh, Matt, let's start with Matt's list. Let's bring up the top ten list. Let's for see Matt. that gorgeous Ghost. face right there. Ooh, look at that! Wow, that is really wide on the names. Kind of wow. has to be. Uh, at number ten, I've got John Ford and John Wayne in The Searchers. At number nine, I've got Wes Anderson and Bill Murray at Rushmore. At number eight, Paul Thomas Anderson and Philip Seymour Hoffman in The Master. At seven, Spike Lee and Denzel Washington and Malcolm X. At six, Quentin Tarantino and Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction. At five, Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio in Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> at four, Tim Burton and Johnny Depp in Ed Wood. At three, Alfred Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart in Rear Window. At two, Akira Kurosawa and Toshiro Mifuni. Is it Mifuni? It's Mifuni. Mifuni. Yeah. At Seven Samurai. And finally, at number one, Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver. That's great. That's a good list, man. It's a great list. It's a very awesome list. Uh, I'll say that for Matt Nest. All right, uh, let's bring up my list there, Adam, if you don't mind. All right, so my number 10 is Wes Anderson and Bill Murray in Rushmore. My number nine, Quentin Tarantino, Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction. John Huston, Humphrey Bogart in The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Albert Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart in Vertigo. John Ford and John Wayne in The Searchers. Spike Lee, Denzel Washington, Malcolm X. David Lean, Peter O'Toole in Lawrence of Arabia. Francis Ford Coppola, Al Pacino in The Godfather Part Two. Martin Scorsese, Robert De Niro, Raging Bull. And Akira Kurosawa, Toshiro Mifune in Yojimbo. So that's our list. There so let's is. compile it. All right, Do, now we, we got to figure out these lists together. We can probably kick out movies. Like we're uh, the combinations are what matters here, yeah. right? Okay. So we've got to fight one too, I think. Yeah, we do. I um, mean, I I'm very strongly about Kurosawa Mufuni. I've given you number one now. 
like two have straight really? shows. Yeah. Have you given me the number one? Or I am logically you. correct. Last to week, give me I, just, I mean, there's a difference. Last here. week, I, I just like, you know what? Let's have fun, and I'll give you point break at number one, even though it's not on my list. That oh. is an anomaly. No, but you, yeah, that's true. You right, gave, that two weeks ago, you sorry. accepted that one because you knew you had made the mistake by not whoa, putting it on. Whoa, whoa, hey, well, no, no, I wasn't hey, trying to. I was using there. your words. Watch the piety. I'm sorry. Judged from on high all of a sudden. <laughs> like, I didn't realize me? in the presence of a great one, <laughs> we all bow. I am penitent before John Roca. <laughs> what? No, don't ever be. All right. So you want to put, all right, that's, I mean, I, you know, yeah. for our international fans, I'm really sorry that we're doing this. I don't feel we should. I look, give right. me Taxi Driver at one and then we'll do well, Joe Jimbo at two. It's Scorsese De Niro. That's what I'm talking about. We're not talking movies. We're talking the combinations. Oh, it's actor, I see what you're collab- saying. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. All so right. we, if movies are irrelevant, it's the com- it's collaborations, right? Fair enough. So you, you still want to put Scorsese and Zero at one? Yeah. All right. Of course. Fine. That's, right why would of, I want to lose in all front of, of Dennis? No less. <laughs> no, that all doesn't right, that's make fine. any sense. That's fine. All right. So then we have Kura Kurosawa and uh, Toshiro Mafuni at two. Okay. Yep. Okay. So then I have Francis Ford Coppola and Pacino at uh, three. Do, well, we've got. What else in commonality do we have? Oh, Anything higher? Uh, Sp- Spike Lee, Denzel Washington, and Malcolm X we have. Uh, what about Hitchcock? I got that at three, and you got that where? Oh, I got that at five, or six, rather. So, yeah, we could put that there if you want. Uh, it seems a little higher. What? So, uh, okay. That you, one? you don't want to put it at three? That's what I'm saying. Hitchcock at three? That's what I just said. I, I apologize. That's why I am trying you, to get... You need to be figuring out what's going on here. My, right. my autocorrect is just going bananas right now. <laughs> yeah, we need a, but and we I'm need, not even kidding. Listen, I'm getting listen, two letters in and it's jumping to words that aren't even in going this Going forward, sequel. we need to have a piece of paper and pen. I think that's yeah. the smartest move. All right, so what are we putting at three? Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart? Is that what we said? Yeah. Okay. And then four. Please, you got to give me Coppola and Pacino. I gave you number one. <laughs> Please, you got it. I gave you number one. All right. Okay, so what you got at five? What are we going to do at five? We, you right, put, we're just going to go off your list. Uh, we'll go, yeah. go through this. You want to go... Uh, 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 next, I got Tim Burton and Johnny Depp, which is not on your list. Okay. And then I got Scorsese and DiCaprio, which is not on your list. Right. But do you want to do Spike Lee and Denzel, since that's on our list, both All right, our let's lists? do that. Then, well, I've got Tarantino and Jackson higher on mine. What about you? I've got it at number nine. At number nine? Yeah. All right. Then that's fine. Let's do... Spike Lee, let's Denzel? Let's do Spike Lee. Okay. So Spike Lee right there. Okay. And then after that, we'll do the Tarantino-Jackson duo. Sounds good. Can I have, after we do Tarantino Jackson, may I please have Tim Burton <laughs> and Johnny Depp? You know what? I didn't realize. Who are you showing off for? I was showing, showing off for. All of a sudden, you're nice and asking this. Come on. Th- oh, wow. Oh, wow. I, all don't right. know, I don't know if nice. <laughs> hey, come on, good. All right, listen. David Lee and Peter O'Toole, we have not talked about that. We haven't. I want that on my list. How many do we have left on at our this list? Point? We have three left, eight, nine, and ten. Okay, then I've got... Okay, I still got Tim Burton plus Scorsese and DiCaprio. You only have Burton and Depp at seven. I apologize. I Do you mean, want Scorsese, Scorsese and DiCaprio? DiCaprio? You want that above seven? You want that at seven instead of Burton and Depp? No, no, no. Okay. No, we're on to the next so, one. On eight? So David Lee and yeah, Peter O'Toole? that's fine. Take Thank it at you. eight. Thank you. You got it at eight. No prisoners! All right, yes, go ahead. Then can I have Scorsese and of DiCaprio? You can have it at nine. You want. Thank you. That's right. And then what do you got left after that? I got PTA and uh, Phil Hoffman and Master. <sighs> What, what you got? What you, uh, what you working with? John Ford, John Wayne, and the Searchers. We haven't put that oh, on. Oh, yeah. We we have, got, we that's got to be that. our number 10, brother. All right. That's fine. Right? Yep. Or Scorsese to Kevin. You want to put Scorsese in twice. I mean, that's your choice. <laughs> why are you judging that choice? <laughs> I'm just saying. We've dropped why, off some really why, good people here. God, so much. Can you feel that out there? <laughs> so much. Uh, just because he has the keyboard in front of him, somehow he is the final arbiter of the <laughs> list. <laughs> Dear God. Dear You'd God. be a good like a contract negotiating lawyer. No, I, I wish. Mean, just... Building those trenches and just slowly moving forward. Just to the wait advance. till the Tom Tent show goes up to renegotiations. We'll <laughs> You're going to act as our counsel? <laughs> yeah, right. I think that's right. officially, and then we put you on retainer. <laughs> retainer? All right. Um, what do you got then? So that's, that's our uh, tent. Right, there. right. So, all right. Can you read that? Can you understand all that? I got you. Okay. Are we, like, are we messing up the shot here? All right. All right. Sorry, Yes, Adam. we are. Right. I will cheat in like now this. Now we'll go like this. We'll go like this. That's there fine. we go. All right. It'll be really awkward as I... <laughs> All right. At number 10, we're running out of time. we got to jump in. Yep. At number 10, John Ford, John Wayne. At number 9, Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. At number 8, David Lean and Peter O'Toole. At 7, Tim Burton and Johnny Depp. At 6, Quentin Tarantino and Sam Jackson. At number 5, Spike Lee and Denzel Washington. At number 4, Francis Ford Coppola and Al Pacino. At number 3, Alfred Hitchcock and Jimmy Stewart. At number 2, Akira Kurosawa and Toshiro Mifune. And finally, at number one, Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro. Boom! 
Boom. There it uh, is. That's There's our a show. List. Top 10 actor director collaborations. Uh, thanks so much for watching this week. We really appreciate it. Thanks for all the many comments you've already posted on YouTube and on Twitter. We really appreciate it. Matt, uh, anything you want to say to the, to the fans? Uh, no, for those out there that have been uh, asking, you can find us on iTunes. Just go to... No, but then let me tell you what I want to say. Well, well, yeah, wrong? sorry. I thought you were going to ask a different question. I'm a good politician. I answer the question I wish asked of me. Uh, yes. If you can't find us on iTunes, just find uh, search out for Collider, and we're part of their feed on iTunes. People have been asking. I've yep. seen in the comments on YouTube. I will uh, try and go online and do my usual sit down for a chunk of time and answer as many as I can yes, for this that. one. Uh, if you want to contact the show, you can do it over email at uh, top10podcast, all spelled out, at Gmail. That is top10podcast yeah. at Gmail. And then Facebook is facebook.com forward slash the top 10 podcast with the number 10. Exactly. Please subscribe to the channel below. Also follow us at Top 10 Show on Twitter. Follow Matt at Matt Nost for, for that good that'll do you. And follow me <laughs> at The Roca Says, R O C H A. You see all the shows I'm hosting or co hosting like this one, or all the shows I'm a guest on. Thanks again, guys, for joining us. We really appreciate you coming on every week and letting us talk to you about movies. We'll see you all next week. Bye bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider. <laughs>